Hi everyone, thank you for um, coming. My name is Christina Rima Murphy and I'm the Open Educational, um, Open and Affordable Educational Resources Librarian at Penn State. <laughs> Hello, I'm Brian McGarry. I'm the Learning Design and Open Education Engagement Librarian also at Penn State. Uh, so open pedagogy projects can be exciting ways to work with students. Brian and I are both involved in a couple of them, um, and we've worked with them in the past. Um, but they're multi multifaceted, and they require new ways of thinking about working in the classroom with students, project management, sustainability. And so Brian and I developed um, the open pedagogy project roadmap um, as a framework for supporting projects, um, whether you're a librarian, an instructor, a technology support person, um, to help them be successful and sustainable. So, Brian, so one thing that you quickly realize whenever you're learning about open pedagogy is that nobody can really agree on a definition of what it is. Um, there's lots of different definitions. There's a few of them here on the, on the screen. Um, we think those are pretty good definitions, but you, you may have others that you prefer. Um, so, you know, what we decided to do was to try to find um, a definition that worked for us. You know, some people see open pedagogy as a specific set of practices. You do A, B, and C, and that equals open pedagogy. Some people see it as more of uh, a mindset, a set of values, things like that. Some people see it as a combination of all of those things. Um, so what we decided to do as we were creating this resource was that we needed to have some kind of common framing so that anybody coming to this resource would understand, okay, what do we mean by open pedagogy? So we looked for uh, commonalities amongst the, the various definitions that we've come across that we liked. Um, so one of those that you'll see is uh, engaging with students as creators. That, that um, is something that certainly comes up a lot. Um, also the experiential learning component that comes along with, with that uh, creation process. Also, um, but because you've got this different way of working with students where they, they are creating, faculty are creating, and they're working together, um, it really challenges the, the usual sort of classroom hierarchy where you've got you know, the sage on the stage uh, imparting this knowledge to the students. Um, there, there's a lot of back and forth and give and take there. Um, also moving towards situated collaborative and renewable assignments. And then finally, really important, um, something we'll highlight again in a moment, the issue of student agency. Okay, so in addition to looking at sort of all the literature that's out there about open pedagogy, um, we also uh, used some of our own experiences with working with open pedagogy uh, projects in order to inform our creation of, of this uh, resource. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a project that I was involved in. Christina will talk about uh, one that she was involved in as well. So the one that I was involved in um, is this uh, Hispanic linguistics uh, open textbook that was authored by students at um, Ohio University, which is an institution I used to work at. Um, and uh, basically w what the situation was with that was that uh, the faculty member for this course, Dr. Ashwini Ganeshan, she um, found that there weren't a lot of good textbooks for this particular subject area. Um, either they were written at a level where the, the students didn't quite have the mastery of the Spanish language to be able to fully understand what was in the textbook, or that the linguistic uh, component of, of the material was a little bit beyond the, the, the level of where students were at at that point. But she saw that students were very good at taking these complex linguistic concepts and kind of breaking them down for their peers so that each other could understand. So she thought, oh, well, you know, why don't we create something that um, the students write? So uh, she started off by, on, on the left side of the screen, uh, you see a snippet of a study guide assignment and that kind of became the, the initial framework for some of the chapters. And then over subsequent semesters, additional uh, assignments were built into the course to fill out other pieces of the textbook. So additional chapters, but also things like um, practice exercises and so forth. So it, it was really developed in this modular sort of fashion over time. So just a, a few lessons learned uh, out of this that I, I think you'll then see reflected in the roadmap itself. One, the idea that um, it, it's a nonlinear process. So like I said, additional assignments were built in to, to fill in gaps that existed um, in the textbook. Also, grading is a, a big issue with, um, with open pedagogy because it's you know, often a very different way of working for students. Um, 
so she based it on specifications grading, and so a part of that is this idea of um, uh, pass, fail, or credit, no credit sort, sort of grading. And um, in addition to that, that students are given the opportunity to revise their, their assignments. Um, and so that serves kind of a twofold purpose. One is that um, it sort of mitigates some of the, the anxiety that students have around uh, working in this new kind of way. They don't get as hung up on the letter grade aspect of it. The other thing, though, that is really beneficial is, you know, if you're creating an entire open textbook, um, if you give students the opportunity to improve their work, then that's sort of less remediation that you have to do on the back end of everything. Um, also, student agency, I, I mentioned a moment ago, very important. Um, so students had the opportunity to either opt in or opt out of having their uh, pieces of material that they created being included in the book. And uh, that was done um, without any sort of implications for, for, their, uh, for their grade in the course. Uh, also, uh, in terms of considering social justice aspects, so she went into this project with uh, certain social justice goals as well. And so those were uh, sort of explicitly inc incorporated in, into the assignments as well. And then finally, um, the aspect of hiring students with specialized skills. So uh, in addition to the students who were in the course uh, creating material, there were also a few student editors who were hired uh, sort of outside of the course. And they did things like uh, helping with editing, but also creating some material and um, creating an audiobook version, things like that. Um, so those students had more advanced knowledge of Spanish and linguistics that put them in a situation to be able to do that. And now uh, Christina can talk a little bit about her project. So I work on a couple of open pedagogy projects. Um, one is an undergraduate research one, it's not this one, um, where we have students are transcribing a digitized manuscript, a recipe manuscript from 1695, and that was sort of the gateway, um, the gateway drug to a bigger open pedagogy project, so to speak, which is this one. It's the same professor. Um, we have just piloted it last year. We're in our second iteration of it. Um, it's an undergraduate English class, half majors, half non-majors. Um, it runs like a traditional 10-week course where students read literature. Um, it's pre-modern literature, so it's all in the public domain. We switched all over to OER anthologies or open digital scholarly editions, um, like the Poulter Project and Margaret Cavendish's Poems and Fancies. Um, and then we changed the final five weeks into an editorial project, where students chose one of the works. Um, we do a lot of workshop time, a lot of, um, I'm a librarian, a lot of research instruction, um, Creative Commons license instruction, um, and students are invited to write an introductory header for extensive footnotes based on their research and find some images, which they will have the um, option, if they choose to consent, to have it included at the end um, in an OER anthology, which we're building. And we were very much inspired by Robin, De Robin DeRosa's open anthology of earlier American literature. Um, we also learned a lot. Um, it's always good to have a pilot. Um, we had to do a lot more scaffolding for students than we had anticipated, particularly around what students were writing. That question came up more often than we expected. What are we supposed to be doing? Students were used, at least in our American university, to writing traditional argumentative English papers where they find evidence from a text. And so writing an introduction for a different audience other than the professor was actually proved a little bit anxiety ridden for some students. Um, that wasn't a format they were used to doing. So we had to do a lot of scaffolding around that, a lot of modeling, and a lot of signposting, which we did much more of this semester and worked much better, there was less anxiety. Um, for me as a librarian, sources, one student said, wow, the sources really matter for this project, which <laughs> was like a yes, but also no, they should always matter. <laughs> um, more than a few students talked about their sources and how they used museum websites or Library of Congress websites or the British Library website for various things. Um, a number of students talked about how personally connected they felt to the text that they chose or to the author. And finally, the authentic audience really resonated for both the type of work that students ended up turning in um, and for them just thinking, oh, I'm going to be writing for future students, right? And now I want to write something that other students like me will want to read. So that was a really great lesson to learn. Um, and so based on our experiences with this, Brian and I created the Open Pedagogy Project Roadmap. These slides, by the way, are all in the um, conference schedule. That URL will take you to it, um, as will that QR code. Thank you for QR codes coming back in the pandemic. <laughs> it's a, a module-based project management resource um, that insists instructors, and we think very broadly about instructors, 
librarians, faculty, disciplinary faculty, um, instructional designers, accessibility experts, and so on and so forth, with planning for and sustaining open pedagogy projects, regardless of their size, scope, or discipline. And we built it around five S's. Um, we're gonna take you briefly through those. Um, it's designed to be really practical and a place to document the affordances and logistics of running an open pedagogy project. Um, it's also discipline agnostic, even though we've both worked sort of in humanities projects, it would work for any field. Um, we're gonna go through in order just very briefly, um, but you can go through it in whatever order you want. And it is, of course, openly licensed. Um, so before, instructors kind of tend to think like, well, what am I gonna have my students do? Right, what's the, what's the project we're gonna do? But we encourage you to think about why. Why are you at the session? Why are you interested in open pedagogy? What do you care about? What about it excites you? Um, and what about it might excite your students, which also might be a little bit different from what excite you, excites you. Um, what are you trying to achieve for yourself? Is this gonna be rewarding for you as an instructor? Will this be valuable for students in terms of learning content, but also learning skills? Um, and what values are you trying to embody in your teaching and inspire in your students? We also ask or encourage people to think about how the project can start out by thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion from the get-go. Um, there's a number of different frameworks or values that people could bring to this. Um, we're gonna share one, and this was not kissing up to anybody that might be in the room. But um, one of the things <laughs> that we do show is Rajiv Janjiani's, um, his five R's for the values of open pedagogy. As an example of what instructors might wanna think about what values um, may be inherent or maybe not right, um, in a project, but that may be there anyway. Um, and one of those is risk, right? So how is this risky for you as a faculty member, for you as a librarian, for the students, right? Um, whether or not they decide to openly license their work, um, it still, there still could be some risk involved. Um, so that's just one, some, some values that we ask people to think about. After you've thought about your values, um, and the other part of scope is scoping capacity. Uh, we all know that capacity is limited for all of us involved, and so really thinking through how much time can be dedicated to a project. When I worked with my instructor, we realized that this was not gonna, we were not gonna have a book ready in a year. That was not gonna happen. We decided to think about it as a five-year project based on what was realistic for us. So it would be built modularly over five years. And we also looked for other examples that we could reuse, right? We used OER anthologies um, that we could bring in as well. And we looked for what collaborators we could work with. And then finally, scoping the project. Um, what will students be doing? When is it gonna happen? What content has to be covered? Um, what's the process actually gonna look like in the classroom? And where is the work gonna happen? In the case of my project, um, we decided not to have students do any work in press books. We didn't have the time to teach them that. We didn't have the time to navigate SharePoint, Microsoft, OneDrive, Google Drive, all those crazy things that we have at our university. <laughs> and we just decided to have students submit their work in the learning management system in Canvas to keep it simple for students and not complicate um, with additional technologies. We plan on using those other uh, spaces as we put together the book, but not for students to deal with. So after thinking about the scope of a project, then we encourage you to think about the support. Um, and at three different levels. Where is there institutional support, um, structural support? Is there funding? Um, is it gonna be some more supported with promotion and tenure, if that is something that is concerning for you? Is there disciplinary support? The professor that I work with is a Renaissance literature professor, and there's a good amount of disciplinary support in the Modern Language Association for doing this kind of work. Um, also thinking about consortia as well. Then thinking about your logistical support. Who are the people that will help make this project successful, right? Um, no matter what, open pedagogy projects are collaborative, because now you're working closely with students on creating some, with something. And so it's good to think beyond just you and the students and who else can make it go well. And accessibility is a really important one to think about from the outset. And then finally, what technologies are gonna support your funding, or support your project, I'm sorry. How are they funded and for how long? Um, one of the things we're thinking about is Penn State uses press books, but being conscious that that's a contract. Um, how long will we have that contract for? And do we have a backup site where we don't want to, if things change, where we still have access to the work that students have done? Brian's going to take us through uh, the last two pieces of the roadmap. All right, yeah, so the, the next piece of the roadmap is really focusing on uh, students in this process. Um, the first part being out outcomes and assessment. So pe open pedagogy is this opportunity to get beyond just focusing on the content of a course. Of course, you know, there are things that you have to cover in a, in a particular uh, class, but it's also this opportunity to work on uh, 
discipline agnostic kinds of uh, knowledge practices, you know, things like research skills and, and so forth. So we encourage instructors to think about ways that they can make it a little bit less about content and more about that, more about process. Um, also, you know, thinking about how students are, are being assessed on, the, on this work. And so I, I talked about a little bit ago with that grade, no grade, opportunities to revise kind of approach. Um, but you know, we recognize that not everybody has uh, that kind of control over, over their, uh, their grading scheme. You, know, you might be a contingent faculty member and you're kind of locked into a, a particular ABCD sort of uh, approach to grading. Um, but even if you don't have that kind of autonomy, um, there are still opportunities to have students uh, sort of read and critique each other's, other, other's work, so to give that kind of element of peer review, um, giving them opportunities to uh, ref write reflectively about the work that they're doing, perhaps. Um, so there are still things that you can do even if you still have to assign A, B, C, D, and so forth types of grades. Um, also, as I've talked about several times already, the issue of student agency is very important. Um, so you know, making it clear to the students who is this going to be shared with, uh, talking to them about uh, Creative Commons licensing so that they can understand what, how this work is going to be shared and what the implications of all of that are, um, ideally giving them agency in that process of choosing the, the license, and then also having the, the agency to choose whether or not their work is going to be shared openly um, and not having any sort of grade impact associated with that. And so then finally, the, the last port, part of the, uh, the roadmap is all about uh, how you're going to share your work and then how you're going to sustain it over the long term. So in terms of thinking about sharing your work, uh, thinking about sort of who you need to, to be communicating about it with, whether that's you know, within your disciplinary community or with your, within your institution or department or something like that, um, but also thinking about venues w where you might uh, share it. So institutional repository, a disciplinary repository, a, an OER-specific repository, perhaps. And then the final piece about uh, sustainability, you know, this is thinking over the long term. What are the, the issues that might come up? along the way, and then in terms of the roadmap, if you've followed it from, uh, you know, A, B, C, D, and so forth, um, you will have identified gaps along the way, things that you need to go back to and, uh, and identify or answer questions or things like that. And so uh, when we do this as like a workshop, we always encourage folks to come up with uh, uh, an action plan, so like something that you're going to do, you know, today or tomorrow, next week, next month, and so forth. Because so often we, we come to these conferences, you hear about really cool things, and then you go back to work, and work gets in the way, and you forget all, all about it. So we don't want people to end up in that sort of situation. And that is all we have. Thank you very much, Christina and Brian. Is there, uh, we have time for one quick question. Uh, is there someone? Who would like to ask Brian Christina something? Yes. <laughs> Hi there. I'm Glenda Cox from the University of Cape Town. I'm very interested in your work. We've done some similar work and starting off on this journey. Um, did you interview the students? I'm just curious. Or were there evaluations? Or how did you? What was your methodology? Thanks. Um, so we haven't actually, that's a research project that I would like to embark on, but we do ask them to write a reflection on the process. And I have an IRB from my class that we ask students if they were willing to consent to have um, their work as part of the IRB anonymously to get some feedback on how they thought of being in this process-oriented um, project. Um, so that's where we've gotten some feedback from students. Um, a lot of the assessment is, uh, actually we do not, there's no, we just ask them to reflect on it. A lot of them talk about the skills they learned in doing this without any prompting. So that's been an interesting piece just to see what students think of it. So some of them are excited to be authors as well to have, you know, have a public work out there. But thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you. In view of the time, I'd like to invite Paula and Monique up to the stage.